Well, hello there. Um, I'm inside tonight. I'd rather be outside, but it's so dark out there and I ain't figured out what to do about the lighting. So I'm inside and uh, you know, one of my um, friends, Chris Quinn, uh, he's passed away. He's one of the greatest friends I ever had. He used to say, hello, amigos and amigases. His Spanish was horrible, but he didn't care. So to honor my friend Chris, hello, amigos and amigases. It's uh, good to be with you. It's um, exciting uh, as we are plunging into the Sermon on the Mount. We're just slugging away at it, and it is rich to study, and I hope you're enjoying it as well. You know, the more that one studies the teaching ministry of Jesus, uh, the more impressed one is with his skill as a teacher. Jesus was a master teacher. Uh, for that matter, he still is. He's teaching us today. I mean, just think about that. Jesus is teaching us today. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying things and I, I've studied and so on and so forth, but anything that I have to teach you, it doesn't really uh, amount to much. What we want is the Holy Spirit to teach us. And whoever he moves through, that's fine. But it's the Holy Spirit that has to teach us. So one of my prayers is that the Holy Spirit would teach us. And it's the Spirit of Jesus. And so think about that. Jesus taught in such a profound way that 2,000 years after this message was taught, uh, we're learning from it still. To me, that is a miracle, and that is so cool. You know, one of the most gifted, charismatic, big-hearted leaders I have ever known is a man by the name of Wayne Cordero. Uh, he's a, a, a pastor and a friend and a mentor to pastors. He's pastored for years at church in Hawaii. And he's, he's the man that taught me the real importance of spending time every day with Jesus. He wrote a book about it called The Divine Mentor. If ever you get a chance to pick up a book by Wayne Cordero called The Divine Mentor. Um, and basically, he talks about the importance of having mentors, both living mem mentors or mentors from hundreds of years ago in books and on the job mentors. All of that's important. But the point that he makes is Jesus becomes our divine mentor through his word and prayer in our interaction with him. Think about that. Jesus mentoring our lives. So he's actually mentoring us right now. Now, when we dig into the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, is shaping and teaching us right now. How cool is that? Now, we're coming to a section where Jesus, of the sermon where Jesus taught his followers that in the kingdom of God, uh, uh, God is not about creating people who obey the law outwardly, but he is creating a people who obey the word the, the law inwardly, obey God inwardly by their hearts being transformed. Uh, so he would say, you've heard it said, obey this outwardly. Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not whatever. But he says, I say to you, let me change your heart so obedience flows from within. And so I want to suggest right now a, a shift in mindset that I believe makes all of the difference in the world. Instead of seeing obedience as doing what God tells you to do, which it is, but instead of seeing it that way, think of obedience as lining up with God's absolute best for your life. Think about that. Instead of seeing obedience as, okay, this is what God said, so I'm gonna obey it. Shift in your mind and begin to look at obedience as lining up with God's absolute best in your life. When you obey God, you are lining up with his absolute best for your life. So he made this point of, of obeying from the heart, from a transformed heart with, he talked about marriage in regards to marriage, adultery, divorce, making vows. Now, He's going to make a point right now, and then he's going to illustrate it 
and describe it through the act of giving to the needy, and then he'll illustrate it through prayer, and then he'll illustrate it through fasting. So let's go. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. We move from chapter 5 to chapter 6, so we're, we're getting there. Matthew 6, verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. Now, here are two aspects to the truth that Jesus is teaching here. And it's guided by a fundamental truth. What you do to serve and please God will be rewarded. What you do for any other reason will also be rewarded. Basically, everything you do is going to be rewarded one way or the other. But it's simply the second law of thermodynamics, which basically states for every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. Though with, uh, there's the creation of heat, which loses a little energy. But for the most part, so if you push, then whatever is pushed up is going to respond accordingly. So basically, he says, when you do something, a reward comes to you, period. Everything you do, a reward comes to you. So he couples that with uh, this truth. Okay, so that's the first truth. Everything you do is rewarded, period. I'll explain more in a minute. But then secondly, someone sees everything we do. There isn't anything really that is done in secret without anyone seeing. There isn't anything we do ever that is not being seen. One second. Because both of these are true, Jesus then says, be careful. Literally, take care, give thought to. You know, if you were hiking with a friend and you came out to this washed out trail that had a ledge on one side and it's strewn with big rocks and your friend says, hey, be careful. You would know, give special thought or consideration where you were walking. I ride a motorcycle and I was riding with my, uh, my buddy who uh, was a, like a mentor to me in the riding of a motorcycle. This was way back, like 2003. And one of, on one of our first trips, I was behind him, and I looked, and his foot kicks out to the side. I thought he had a cramp. And uh, his name is Tim. And all of a sudden, I said, what? And lo and behold, his big old boulder comes across. It was in the road. And then I saw what he was doing. He was telling me, be careful. There's a dangerous object in the road. So then you just learn that if you're right in front and some, you come to something, you put out your foot, and who's ever behind you knows to look out. Well, that's what Jesus is doing here. He's necessarily sticking out his foot saying, be careful, pay attention. Give thought to how you do good and more importantly, why you do good. What Jesus taught was meant to be understood by everyday common people like you and me, not just theologians, not just philosophers, people who work to take care of their families and want to do right by God. So he starts here with how you should do your acts of righteousness, not whether you should do them, the Bible says very clearly that we are to be salt and light. We are to do good. We are to be a blessing. But how you do them is very important. He says, don't do them like the hypocrites. Now, they would have understood the word hypocrite because of the, the uh, predominance of Greek culture and its theater. And a, a hypocrite comes from uh, an actor, someone who is playing a role. So he may or may not be uh, this general, but he is playing the role of a general, though behind the mask, he's not a general. So a hypocrite is a person who pretends to have virtues or moral religious beliefs, principles, but the he or she doesn't really possess them uh, and whose real life belies their stated belief. It's from the Greek word hypocrites, which that, like I said, is an acting term, playing to the critics. Crite is critic. So plain to the critics, plain to those who are looking at you, that is being a hypocrite, not who you really are, playing a role. 
A hypocrite is someone who's playing a role, but who doesn't really believe what he or she is espousing. In this case, Jesus says, don't do it like the hypocrites who are saying, I love to help the poor. Look at me. Look what I'm giving. Ain't I something? I think of the character in Godfather 2. Uh, Godfather 1 is my family's favorite movie, we as a family. And then Godfather 2 is, is equal with it. To us, Godfather 3 never even happened. But Godfather 2, you have young Vito Corleone who lives in the neighborhood and there's a gangster there, a guy in a white suit. And eventually Vito Corleone takes over that area and nails that guy. But this guy's going down the street celebrating a festa or Spanish fiesta, festa in Thai. And he's, there's, a, there's a religious, uh, either a saint or the virgin, I don't know, I can't remember which one. And the guy puts money on there and hey, everybody claps. Now that is what Jesus is talking about. Doing acts of righteousness that you might have the praise of men. Now, Jesus says, don't do that. Instead, and this is the most important thing I'm going to say to you today. Live your life, Jesus says, to an audience of one. Live your life to an audience of one. And that audience is not your spouse, is not your friends, is not your children, is not your boss. It is is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the real only audience that ultimately matters. What you do to serve and please God will be rewarded. What you do for any other reason will also have its own reward. Because someone is seeing everything you do. Nothing is done in secret. So, <clears throat> If you do something for the praise of men or to be considered cool or to be considered generous or to be considered, if you do this for other people's affirmation, you will have your reward. They think you're awesome. They think you're cool. They think you're really something. They think you're a major league Jesus follower, whatever. That is your reward if that's your motivation in doing it. But a Christ follower really lives out his or her, her life for an audience of one. What I do, I do as unto the Lord. If I sweep a dock in a warehouse, that's my job, then I sweep that warehouse as unto the Lord. If I sell real estate, I sell real estate as unto the Lord. I treat the people as if they were Jesus with character, integrity, and love, and I serve them well. But my ultimate audience is to the Lord. What I do, I do as unto the Lord is what the Word of God teaches us to do. Now, here's a really a major difference in the lifestyle of a believer and the lifestyle style of a Christ follower. A person could be a believer in Jesus and yet feel that his omniscience, that is his ability to see and know everything, is a liability. It's like a groan. Oh, man, Jesus sees me. But as a believer grows into a Christ follower, then he or she begins to welcome the fact that God sees and knows everything and he knows everything that there is to be known. He, he is there and we welcome his presence in our life. We welcome. Now, or do we do things we're ashamed of? Yes. And so we repent and say, Lord God, forgive me. But a Christ follower lives celebrating the presence of the Lord, not treating it like a liability and something that is like, oh man, Jesus is watching. No. That's immaturity. Maturity embraces and welcomes the eyes of the Lord. Search me, O Lord, and see if there be any unclean thing in me. Now, here's a way to look at rewards, because sometimes rewards don't make sense. Here's a basic definition that I've kind of come up with. Doing blessable things, receive a blessing. When you do blessable things, sharing Christ is a blessable thing. Encouraging a discouraged friend is a blessable thing. Tearing down someone with your words is not a blessable thing. But it does have its reward. It's just not from God. When you speak negatively of someone, tear someone down, gossip about somebody, you get your reward right then and there. Man, the, the feeling of... Um, belonging that you get from people that agree with you. Yeah, he was a horrible this, or he was a great this, and whatever, the uh, Democrats are this, the Republicans are this, that guy. When, when people love to tear people down and you join in that, oh man, there you got your reward. You're being affirmed because you're part of this group. But that's your reward. 
When Jesus says, when you live your life with people as your audience, that's your reward. But when you live your life with Jesus as the audience of significance, there is going to be a blessing, a reward, both here in this life and in the life to come. So when you think, hey, Jesus, I just don't see it here. It's just one hard thing after another. Get the, the, the happy stuff here. Sometimes obedience is very painful. We just watched with my kids Chariots of Fire again for, I hadn't seen that thing in 30 years. But uh, uh, Liddell, the main character in it, he ended up going as a missionary to China, captured by, by the Japanese, and gave his life caring for, prison, caring for prisoners in the POW camp until eventually he died in the prisoner war camp. Sick and horribly. Well, don't think that God didn't see. And though... He may not have had a comfortable reward here. There's going to be a reward for him that we can't even begin to grasp. When we worry about the toughness of life here, and I'm trying to serve you, Lord God, Jesus says, calma, tranquilo. By the way, tune in next week because we unpack this completely as far as um, uh, rewards in heaven and, and where you invest for your future. You may not see it now, but when you put Jesus first and obey, you line up with his best, you are making an incredible investment in eternity. And this ain't from my mouth. This is from the mouth of Jesus. You are making an incredible investment in eternity. And talk about compound interest. Man, you, you share Christ with one person who life, whose life then doesn't end up in suicide but ends up prosperous and healthy who then raises a family, who then has a, is a blessing, and then you've got multiple, multiple blessings that go down through history, through the decades, through the centuries. Talk about compound interest. We're going to talk about all of that next week. But for today, here's what Jesus is saying. Be very careful how you serve. Make sure you serve to an audience of one who is Jesus, not for the praise of men, but for the one who sees. And when you serve him in secret, he sees, and he will reward you openly. So, um, I want to tell you about something that I'm launching, by the way. You know, I've been wondering, what am I supposed to do with my fourth quarter? I, I, I've pastored, I've led a, a college, now university, uh, I've done all kinds of stuff, it's wanting to serve the Lord since I was 17, and now I'm in my fourth quarter. What am I going to do? You know, I've spent the last 40 years investing in people and learning a lot from them. So I really believe I heard what I was supposed to do. Besides being this, a teacher and a writer and a speaker in the Cana Project, I attended some class intensives, took some tests, and now I'm a certified life coach and I'm launching Florist Life Coaching. My signature offer is something called Dream Reignite. I believe there's a bunch of people who are entering or in their second half of life and are wondering, now what? So I'm going to help people rediscover and reignite their dream and develop a day-by-day -day followable plan to get there. This could be one of the most significant investments people ever make in themselves. So if you are interested in having a free 30-minute conversation about your life and future, just write coaching, coaching, on the comment section of, of this video. And then I'll reach out to you uh, with an invitation. Very excited about this and uh, pretty wonderful. Now, <clears throat> I know it's been a tough season since coronavirus came to the party. Things are gonna turn around this spring, I believe. I'm excited about the news about vaccines and us turning the corner on this thing. Uh, but let me tell you what one of the most powerful weapons against discouragement is. It's not a vaccine. The most powerful weapon against discouragement is the spirit of gratitude. So I'm inviting you and encouraging you this week to fly into this week as we head into this week of Thanksgiving with a spirit of gratitude. Just launch into this week. The, tomorrow's the first day of the week. Sunday's the first day of the week. Not Monday, Sunday. Head into this new week 
giving praise to God, thanking him for everything he's done in your life, thanking him by faith for what you do not see, but you, but you seize by faith. Get, give praise this week, not just on Thursday, but going into this week. Give praise for every blessing you can think of. And I promise you, a spirit of heaviness, a spirit of despair, a spirit of depression will lift. Let's give him praise. Speaking of blessing, let me end this time together today with a blessing over your life. Lord, for these who you love so much, I pray a blessing. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. If you're interested in having a free 30-minute conversation with me, write coaching and I'll reach out to you. And I'm very, very excited about what God's doing in your life and in mine and how he is building his kingdom. Let's... Partner with him together. God bless you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.